Welcome everyone to the, to the first uh, eclectics of the fall semester. I'm Joyce Ono. I'm, I'm the temporary coordinator for today. Our usual coordinator, Janice Jang, was supposed to be in Hokkaido today. And as many of you know, what happened there over the weekend. Um, but I'm happy to introduce our speaker today. Professor Kay Stanton is from Cal State Fullerton. She's a Shakespeare specialist and a professor of English at Cal State Fullerton. She's published over 30 scholarly articles and has presented papers at over 100 professional conferences in 12 foreign countries and 21 American states. Quite an accomplishment. Her book, Shakespeare's, which she's speaking about today, Shakespeare's Horrors, Erotics, Politics, and Poetics, um, was, was published in, I think, 2014 by Palgrave Macmillan Press, and she's currently working at another, this is going to be really interesting, on Shakespeare and quantum physics. <laughs> She created the Cal State, we're waiting for that talk after you're done with that. You'll probably get another kind of audience here. <laughs> she created the Cal State Fullerton Graduate Student Acacia Conference, which is a group of uh, graduate students. Um, and she's also been the Cal State University System-wide Shakespeare Symposium uh, coordinator several times. So please welcome Dr. Kay Stanton to our, and her presentation today I think is about her book, right? Horrors. Shakespeare's Women. Thank you. The title of my talk today is Shakespeare's Women. Uh, this is, um, with some few slight modifications, the first chapter of my book, Shakespeare's Horrors, Erotics, Politics, and Poetics. I am not a whore. <laughs> As it should be needless to say, being that, like many of my audience, I earned my living as a university professor, specialized in Shakespeare studies, not as a professional sex worker. Yet that has not prevented several men from calling me a whore at various points in my life. The lady doth protest too much, you think? Well, I introduce my experience as it iterates the comparable cases of Shakespearean women like unmarried virgin hero in the comedy Much Ado About Nothing, newlywed Desdemona in the tragedy Othello, and wife and mother Hermione in the romance The Winner's Tale, as well as the cases of countless other actual women, whatever their so sexual and social status, similarly slandered with that or other sexually insulting names for centuries before and after Shakespeare wrote, including these current days of the 21st century. At the risk of sounding like something even worse than a whore, at least to most contemporary literary critics, an essentialist, I must assert as a reliable generalization that a woman not employed in the sex industry does not enjoy being called a whore. And probably most professional sex workers prefer other terms. Many women even dislike saying, or like Desdemona, cannot say whore, as it does, quote, abhor them when they speak the word, unquote. This further generalization is borne out in our author's canon by the observation that of the 59 instances of the word whore in Shakespeare's works, 51 come from male characters, leaving only eight instances from a total of five female characters. And only one of these, professional sex worker Dal Tearsheet of uh, Henry IV, part two, owns the term by choosing to describe herself by it. But if only one Shakespearean female character calls herself whore, Many others not only openly acknowledge, but are also delighted to express their sexuality. Though they may be unjustly labeled by their society as whores, and shocked and confused by such names for them, their aim is simply to self-actualize in ways that include expression of their sexuality. And my book is devoted to their and our ongoing quest to do so without social condemnation. The appellation better suited for them is one that also, however, relates significantly, as the book discusses, to the notion of whoredom, Venus. No matter whether the culture depicted in a given play by Shakespeare is pagan or Christian, the bard habitually has both female and male characters reference elements of Greco-Roman mythology, including the concept of the goddess. Romeo, for example, definitely living in a Christian society, complains that his initial love object, Rosaline, 
quote, will not be hit with Cupid's arrow as she hath Diane's wit, unquote. And after he has fallen in love with Juliet, he expresses his wish for Juliet, far more fair than the goddess Diana, to, quote, cast off Diana's vestal livery. Similarly, in the Christian culture of all's well that ends well, Helena, in love with Bertram, son of the Countess of Brazilian, entreats the Countess to endorse her love by identifying with her as a woman and remembering whether she, quote, did ever in so true a flame of liking, wish chastely and love dearly, that her Diane was both herself and love, as Helena does. Later, when on the brink of expressing her desire to Bertrand, Helen sa uh, Helena says, quote, now Diane, from thy altar do I fly, and to imperial love, that God most high, do my size stream, unquote. In both plays, within a Christian culture, the goddess Diana is nonetheless regarded as both a useful poetic symbol and an archetype of female virginity, but one that can be replaced with a different image when a girl embraces transition into active sexuality. A difference does exist between these two examples, however. Romeo, operating from his own sexual frustration, himself casts the virginal Diana image onto both female objects of his desire, and then asserts his wish personally to dislodge it, whereas Helena identifies with the Diana archetype within herself, inquires whether another woman also has related to it, and herself determines the point when she wishes to self-actualize beyond it. In her foreword to psychologist Jean Bolin's book, Goddesses in Every, Women, Every Woman, A New Psychology of Women, renowned feminist Gloria Steinem identifies herself as one who had initially been, quote, resistant to its theme, unquote, because, quote, after all, how can mythological goddesses from a patriarchal past help us to analyze our current realities or reach an egalitarian future? Yet, having been won over by the book, she determines, quote, at a minimum, these archetypal goddesses are a useful shorthand for describing and thus analyzing many behavior patterns and personality traits. And at a maximum, they are ways of envisioning and thus calling up needed strengths and qualities within ourselves." Unquote. Bolin herself notes that, quote, the Jungian perspective has made me aware that women are influenced by powerful inner forces or archetypes, which can be personified by Greek goddesses, whereas the feminist perspective has given me an understanding of how outer forces or stereotypes, the roles to which society expects women to conform, reinforce some goddess patterns and repress others, unquote. With the result that, she continues, quote, I see every woman as a woman in between, acted on from within by goddess archetypes and from without by cultural stereotypes, unquote. The Helena of All's Well, then, easily may be seen to be such a woman in between as she moves between archetypes and within a society quick to stereotype her. Boland's book is one of many that emerged in the late 20th century and that continue internationally in the 21st to attract readers in both the scholarly and the general community who find contemporary relevance in the goddess concept. In her book, Goddess, A Celebration in Art and Literature, Jalaja Bodheim, addressing the question of why there has been a, quote, immense surge of interest in the goddess in recent years, states, quote, the first most obvious answer is that the goddess reveals to us the feminine face of God, long neglected in Western religion. And less obvious, but equally important, is the fact that unlike the transcendent Judeo-Christian God, goddesses are generally imminent powers who act within the world and are one with the world." Unquote. In seeking to fly from Diana's altar, Helena of All's Well, living in a patriarchal culture, identifies love as that God most high, a male deity, but she will only be able to achieve sexual consummation with Bertram through the agency of a Diana in the world, Diana Capulet. Patriarchal, patriarchal Judeo-Christian culture's identification of deity as solely male allows men to see themselves as partaking of divinity and determines women only to be dutiful, compliant objects of it, with both social and, polit and political negative impact upon the women. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, Duke Theseus tells Hermia, to you your father should be as a god, 
one that composed your beauties, with her mother's biological contribution entirely effaced. And furthermore, Hermia is to think of herself, quote, but as a form in wax, by him imprinted and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Excuse me. The deified father figure is to be regarded as solely creating the female and holding the power to imprint upon her as he sees fit, even if he disfigures her in the process. Such a disfiguring of a daughter by her father transpires in Much Ado About Nothing when, at the wedding altar, Claudio, wrongly accusing Hero of sexual transgression, claims, you seemed to me as Diane in her orb, unquote. But now he believes her, quote, more intemperate in your blood than Venus, unquote. And Hero's father, Leonardo, is quickly convinced to join in smearing her. Quote, she, oh, she is fallen into a pit of ink that the wide sea hath drops too few to wash her clean again, unquote. This idea of the female as a malleable form or blank surface for the male, be he father, husband, intended partner, or even any random man, to shape or inscribe is evident too in Othello's irate question to his innocent wife, Desdemona. Quote, was this fair paper, this most go goodly book of her body, made to write whore upon, unquote? Just as, as Claudio and Leonardo cast their blo blots upon Hero, it is Othello himself, of course, influenced by Iago, who is inscribing the label upon the astonished Desdemona, who is left to ask the as yet unknown instigator himself, am I that name, Iago? <clears throat> in analyzing the most horrific instance in Shakespeare's canon of such male inscription of a female, the rape and mutilation of Ti in Titus Andronicus, of Lavinia by Chiron and Demetrius, Evelyn Gajowski, building upon Susan Gubar's essay, The Blank Page and Issues of Female Creativity, in her own essay, Lavinia as Blank Page in the Presence of Feminist Crim Critical Practices, argues that Lavinia, quote, provides the best early modern stage representation, perhaps, of Gubar's theory of the blank page upon which males in narratives and history inscribe fellow gen, fellow gen, gen set, Philogocentric meaning. Shakespeare, she continues, dramatizes on the English stage the symbolic economy that Gubar theorizes in a patriarchal society. Male inscription of meaning upon a female with a pen penis. Yet, despite overwhelming odds, Lavinia, quote, manages to overcome formidable obstacles, adopt a subject position, and write, naming the crime and identities of her rapists. The best means, then, of combating patriarchal victimization, even if, as for Lavinia, not escaping it, is to write, or otherwise to become a speak speaking subject, rather than allowing oneself to remain ob an objectified blank page. In the tragedy Titus Andronicus, besides amputating her hands, Lavinia's rapists actually cut out her tongue to prevent her from communicating their guilt. In the comedy Love's Labor's Lost, written during the same early period of Shakespeare's career, that identical gruesome act is ratified, though not enacted, by the King of Navarre and his three lords, Barone, Dumaine, and Longueville, in setting forth their planned ac academe. In order to ensure their concentration upon their studies, they are to agree to avoid the company of ladies. But for enforcement, the onus is on the lady. Quote, no woman shall come within a mile of the king's court, unquote, with the transgressor's penalty being, quote, losing her tongue, unquote. A man, however, would only, quote, endure such public shame as the rest of the court can possibly devise, Ooh, unquote. This double standard of punishment is truly astonishing, but it, is fur it furthermore carries the irony that the female offender is to be rendered speechless while the male would suffer only the shaming speech of the rest of the male court. And it also seems to, re to reflect a subconscious fear of the female and her speech. When the king and three lords must honor a diplomatic commitment to meet with the princess of France and her three ladies, Rosalind, Catherine, and Maria, the, and the men promptly fall in love with them, 
Each man displaces the blame for his failure to live up to the oath onto the lady who is the object of his desire. For example, in his poem letter professing his love for the Lady Maria, Longaville asserts, quote, a woman I forswore, but I will prove, thou being a goddess, I forswore not thee, unquote, for, quote, my vow was earthly, thou a heavenly love, thy grace being gained cures all disgrace in me, unquote. A woman is called a goddess to be not only the scapegoat, but simultaneously also the ab agent of absolution for the male. Furthermore, the men's lust is projected upon the women to make them seem the sexually licentious ones, as is evident in Barone's response to overhearing Longueville's poem letter, which he says, quote, makes flesh a deity, a green goose, a slang term for whore, a goddess, unquote. Each having been revealed as an oathbreaker, an oathbreaker slash lover, the four men share a mo moment of unity, but then quickly move into competition over whose lady is best and whose worst. The king, Dumaine, and Longueville seem to agree that Barone's lady, Rosalyn, is the worst. As Barone himself had privately expressed the same thought, he has to work particularly hard to make his case for Rosalind's attractions. After Longueville likens Rosalind to his shoe, Barone counters, oh, if the streets were paved with thine eyes, her feet were much too dainty for such tread. In other words, if the street were made of, of men's eyeballs, then her feet are too dainty to walk even on that. Only to have Dumaine re remark, oh, vile, then as she goes, what upward lies, the street should see as she walked overhead. So if the street is, if the cobblestones are men's eyeballs, those uh, eyeballs are looking like this up the lady's skirt as she passes. The Shakespeare reveals that if these men put a woman on a pedestal as a goddess, it is to look up her skirt. <laughs> these ladies, however, maintain their tongues and their wit. After each man has set his, sent his poem letter with a love token to his desired lady, the ladies are not impressed. What is apparent to the ladies from the men, men's poem letters is that the men are in love not with the actual beings of the ladies themselves, but with their, the men's, subconscious projections of their own ideal love objects, emphasis on objects. The ladies demonstrate that awareness when they exchange the men's love tokens and don masks prior to the men's visit, and the men mistake their ladies because of the exchange tokens. Seeing his objectifying marker of identity upon a particular lady is the distinguishing feature to each man to determine her as his, such that he woos, quote, but the sign of she, unquote, and the ladies expose the men's folly. Far from becoming victims of male inscription and objectification, as is Lavinia in the tragedy Titus Andronicus, whose father ultimately kills her to obliterate the family shame of her rape, the ladies of the comedy Love's Labor's Lost depart for France upon hearing the death of the princess's father, informing the men that if they can fulfill the vows that the ladies have tasked them with accomplishing, then maybe they might consider marrying them after a year's trial, which the men are likely to fail, as indicated by the play's title, Love's Labor's Lost. Genre matters and it is manifested largely through a play's level of female dependence and autonomy. Because the ladies of Love Lab Love's Labor's Lost are so financially and politically independent, so knowledgeable about their own desires, so self-aware of their sexuality, and so skillful in commun communicating their will, they even manage to revise the genre of romantic comedy. As Barone complains, quote, our wooing doth not end like an old play. Jack hath not Jill. These ladies' courtesy might well have made our sport a comedy." Unquote. In resisting the men's version of themselves as goddesses, they actually managed to assert the Venus qualities in themselves, in their own desired version. Among the goddess figures of Greco-Roman mythology, the pagan system primarily referenced by Shakespeare, Aphrodite Venus, goddess of love and sexuality, invokes the most ambivalence in his time and ours, as critical attitudes toward Shakespeare's represent representation of her in his narrative poem, Venus and Adonis, reflects. Since Judeo-Christian religious thought took hold in Western sensibility, 
the divinity of Aphrodite Venus has been befouled, and with it, female expression of sexuality generally. Paul Friedrich notes that the, quote, avoidance of Aphrodite and her associations reflects deep cultural and religious biases, as typically one has few adjustments to make when coming from the older New Testament to Zeus or Athena, but a great many with respect to Aphrodite if she is to be taken seriously as a religious figure symbolizing profound values and great ambivalences, and who, for the Greeks, merited the epithets revered and awe-inspiring. Contemporary women and men would do well to recapture some of this reverence and awe, which could help to undo some of the wrongs against women committed in the name of patriarchal religion's misogyny that have lingering impact on, on women's free expression of and open enjoyment of sexuality, the erotics of this book's title. Although I believe that contemporary religious doctrines should be critically scrutinized and the slanders and unjust treatments of women encoded within them be exposed and challenged, I'm not suggesting that we need go so far as to cast away any religious affiliation that we might hold and instead build, build temples for the worship of the goddess. For one thing, it would be unnecessary as the temples have already been built, the patriarchal versions of them anyway. We encounter them every day in 21st century culture as they are all around us in the form of print, film, digital, and especially internet pornography, men's magazines, phone sex services, strip clubs, massage parlors, escort services, brothels, etc. Anytime a man responds to an embodiment or representational image of a sexualized female, perhaps with his money, but especially with his erotic attention and ejaculatory release, he is making a sh an offering at a shrine of Venus. Though usually he is regarding her only as Venus porne, and probably doing so in a spirit not of reverence, but of blasphemy. Of course, patriarchal culture infuses him with that attitude. As Jennifer and Roger Wolger state, quote, the patriarchy can't live without Aphrodite Venus, and they can't live with her either, as the old cliche goes. So since the time when men first wrested patrilineal control from women, exactly the moment that I believe Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis enacts, as it described in chapter six of my book, they have mistrusted Aphrodite's, Venus's, liberal polygamous spirit, doing everything possible to confine and reject her by making her either a concubine, a prostitute, a courtesan, or a mistress. Yet in their longing for her ecstatic, almost mystical gifts of love and pleasure, men have never been able to banish her entirely." Unquote. So where does that leave women? Both the women who involve themselves in the generating and sale of such images and enactments of Venus porne, and the women who do not and are frightened, troubled, insulted, and intimidated from free heterosexual expression by them. As I have already been suggesting, one place could be the complete works of Shakespeare. Our author analyzes the forces that inhibit women's full self-actualization and provides to discerning readers means for understanding and combating these issues, not only in our culture's past, but also in our present and future, if we peruse his canon with the sensibility that our present informs and our future can manifest. Many of Shakespeare's characters, when pondering a problem, look to and then empathize or identify with various figures in similar situations from myth and or earlier literature. And surely Shakespeare is inviting us to do the same. Just as historical and archeological and, uh, just as historical and archeological scholarship helps in our gaining a sense of the past, so do feminist, political, psychological, and archetypal approaches to Shakespeare enable us to trace our present from that past, noting continuities as well as differences. As presentist critic Hugh Grady states, quote, the past continually changes its shape and meaning for us as we move, move further into the future, gain new experiences and new perspectives, and research, rethink, and reevaluate the past, unquote. Kiernan Ryan observes that it is, quote, not so surprising to find Shakespeare dramatizing problems that were embryonic in early modern England, but, who is in, but whose mature form in our present he was already in a position to envisage, unquote. 
Indeed, Ryan's concern is not that presentism reads Shakespeare through contemporary lenses, but instead that its practitioners could fail to recognize that the bard's vision travels beyond ours. Quote, presentist criticism of Shakespeare will be credible only if it engages in a dialogue with futurity as open and dynamic as the dialogue it must engage in with the past, unquote. Study of Shakespeare's works, then, can assist us both in personal self-actualization in our present and in working toward more productive and just social and political structures for humanity's future. Feminist criticism of Shakespeare has enabled us to discern the structures of patriarchy that confine and constrict expression of full human potential for women. And many women, academics and general readers, actresses and directors, have understood that he is one of our greatest advocates. Shakespeare's female characters strive to express their sexuality as an integral element of their identities and potential happiness. And although the bard is arguably always on their side, these women typically find that patriarchal culture manifested particularly in their fathers and unexpectedly often too in their chosen male partner is determined to thwart them in their desires. Consider Hermia in A Midsummer Night's Dream, in love with Lysander but told by her father that she must marry his choice, Demetrius, or die. When informed by Duke Theseus that her other option is to become a nun, she vows that she would prefer to live a life of celibacy, quote, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his, Demetrius's, lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty, unquote. Luckily for Hermia, A Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy. She faces obstacles and setbacks, but she does finally triumph over her father's opposition and marries the man of her choice. Women in the tragedies face far more serious trouble, as they may be murdered even on suspicion without fact that they are whores. Thus, the genre in which a female character finds herself determines her likelihood not only of success, but even of survival. Since Aristotle described them, we have understood distinctions among genres with his poetic setting expectations, which Shakespeare's often, Shakespeare often took liberties in subverting, as in Love's Labor's Lost. But, Shakespearean, but Shakespeare's actors, in compiling the first folio, did see fit to divide the plays, with the exception of Troilus and Cressida, orphaned between categories, into the genres of comedy, history, and tragedy. I suggest that no matter where or in what time period a play by Shakespeare takes place, its genre, or poetics, is determined in large part by how much power the female characters may access and wield. The genre, therefore, depicts a society's degree of cultural and social advancement, especially in its attitudes toward women, their sexuality in particular. Another factor in genre includes the politics of the play, both in the literal political, especially in the histories, and the sexual senses of the term, as well as in these meanings interactions. In Troilus and Cressida, for example, Shakespeare makes plain that female sexuality may be objectified, exploited, and scapegoated for male political goals. Helen of Troy is called, quote, a pearl whose price hath launched above a thousand ships and turned crowned kings to merchants, unquote. The overt war over Helen as sexual object can, covers the covert mo motivation of desire for political conquest and the plundering of riches. The men in Love's Labor's Lost who tried to objectify their ladies by their own material markers failed because the play's women had social and political agency. Troilus and Cressida's Helen and Cressida do not, are labeled as whores, and are objectified as spoil of, spoils of war in the play whose genre most resists classification, possibly because of its transculturalism, in which the past is simultaneously the present and a foreboding of a potential future, which leads Ryan to call it, quote, a grim prevision of life under late capitalism at its most predatory, alienating, and destructive, unquote. Thus an ongoing, ongoing cautionary tale for the 21st century. Therefore, I would classify Troilus and Cressida as primarily a mythic allegoric history, one that treats the Trojan War not only as an archetype of all wars, 
but also as a political and sexual political story that is yet unfolding and up to us in the present and future to conclude. Shakespeare's female characters, like his male characters, desire love and sexual pleasure, as both Maurice Charney and Stanley Wells have each noted in their books on sexuality in Shakespeare's works. But without political and social rights equivalent to those of male characters, the female characters are forced to face difficult dilemmas in fulfilling those desires. As noted above, the comedies provide the most hospitable uh, um, environment for female characters' self-expression. But even within that realm, Catherine of the Taming of the Shrew recognizes that, quote, our lances are but straws, our strength as weak, our weakness past compare, unquote. In Catherine's problem of dealing with a husband who declares the opposite of plain reality, Petruchio's, quote, I say it is the moon that shines so bright, unquote, to Catherine's, I know it is the sun that shines so bright, unquote, Petruchio wins the argument simply by, being, uh, by virtue of his being a man. Quote, now by my mother's son, and that's myself, it shall be moon or star or what I list, unquote. As the page impersonating his supposed posed wife tells Christopher Sly about the play to follow in acting the Catherine and Petruchio story, quote, it is a kind of history, unquote. Similarly to Troilus and Cressida, this comedy is, in addition, a kind of history. Here, the sexual political history of male denial of the female to affirm her truth, a truth with more valid validity than ridiculous male assertions that refuse its credibility. The sun-moon argument may be read as a metaphor for all the times in history that a truth as asserted by women has been negated by men who have tried to silence it while pro proclaiming their idea of innate male supremacy that supposedly entitles them to sole access to social, political, and sexual power. Catherine's famous speech near the end of the play has called forth many and diverse interpretations, that she has been tamed, that she has not, but has learned how to play the game of seeming subservient in order to manipulate her husband and her society, that she is advocating a kind of mutuality in marriage based on compromise, et cetera. What seems most important, however, is that Shakespeare leaves each of these and other possibilities open for us to decide. What do we want to be the meaning of Catherine's speech? And after she has at least erased the shrew name that had been inscribed upon her by her father and her society, what do we want to be the next stage of her and other women's history in political, social, and erotic forums? If Shakespeare's comedies generally provide the most welcoming available realm for his female characters to attempt full self-actualization, the last five of those plays, in a subcategory that critics call his romances, offer in visionary mo modes utilizing Greco-Roman mythology in some ways in which problems depicted by his tragedies, especially those involving male-female sexual relationships, may be resolved and overcome should patriarchal society decide not to continue to indulge in it, its self-destructive impulses. The Winner's Tale, for example, re-examines the problem from Othello of a man's obsessive and irrational jealousy that provokes him falsely to believe in his wife's sexual infidelity. Leontes, king of Sicilia, on the basis solely of his imagination, determines his wife, Hermione, to have been a bed swerver and brings her to trial as an adulteress soon after she has given birth to their second child, a daughter, whom he has sent away, quote, where chance may nurse or end it, unquote. During her trial, noting that she has been, quote, on every post proclaimed a strumpet, unquote, Hermione realizes that her truth is overmatched by her husband's political power to support his accusation. Quote, mine integrity being counted falsehood shall, as I express it, be so received, unquote. Even though messengers bring in the report from the oracle at Delphos, proclaiming Hermione's in innocence, Leontes prefers his own belief, quote, there is no truth at all in the oracle, unquote. 
Immediately after this blasphemy, he receives word of the death of his son, shortly after by the report of Hermione's death. Recognizing and repenting the error of his judgment and his crime against Hermione, for 16 years, Leontes lives in, quote, saint-like sorrow, unquote, continually reminded of his guilt by Hermione's friend Paulina, until suddenly his lost daughter, Perdita, returns. And Paulina takes a group, including Leontes and Perdita, to her house to view a statue of Hermione. The statue is said to have been crafted by Giulio Romano, an Italian Renaissance artist whose mention in an ancient pagan culture is a deliberate anachronism pointing to the present of Shakespeare's audience within the depicted past. When Leontes examines the statue and notices that, quote, Hermione was not so as much wrinkled, nothing so aged as this seems, unquote, Paulina replies, quote, so much the more are Carver's excellence, which lets go by some 16 years and makes her as she lived now, unquote. The group's awe over the verisimilitude of the statue increases, with Leontes so moved by it that he wishes to kiss it. And then Paulina claims that she can make the statue move indeed, descend from the pedestal, and take Leontes by the hand. But it, it is required you do awake your faith. When all agree to do so, Paulina states, music, awake her, strike. Music plays, tis time, descend, be stoned no more, approach, unquote. Hermione then descends from the pedestal. Leontes touches her and learns that, oh, she's warm, unquote, and she, quote, embraces him, unquote. At request to make her speak, too, Paulina urges Perdita to interpose and pray your mother's blessing. After Perdita does so, Hermione speaks indeed to entreat the gods to pour their graces upon her daughter's head. The transformation from statue to living woman unmistakably references the story of Pygmalion and Galatea, told by Ovid, one of Shakespeare's famous, uh, favorite authors. In it, the sculptor Pygmalion, a misogynist with contempt for actual women, crafts a magnificently beautiful statue of a woman and falls in love with it. He prays to Venus for the love of a, of a woman as beautiful as his statue, but she grants what she recognizes as his ultimate prayer by making his statue come to life. One may interpret that Pyg Pygmalion had accomplished what the king and lords of Love's Labor's Lost had attempted, the absolute objectification of and projection upon women in, uh, a woman inscribing solely male authorship by having composed female beauty worthy of love. Yet, as Shakespeare was also to do with the story of Venus and Adonis that he found in Ov Ovid as well, he transforms the tale, giving it feminist depth. In The Winner's Tale, a living woman had been so degraded by her husband's slandering, <laughs> by her husband's labeling her with the name Strumpet, that she was deactivated by it, made apparently dead, <coughs> turned to stone, and then after her husband under understands the magnitude of his crime against her and sufficiently <coughs> repents, another woman brings her back to life and still another woman, her daughter, enables her to speak by re regarding her with faith and reverence. If we too can awake our faith that Shakespeare has relevance to our present and future, we may find a helpful allegory in this last scene of The Winner's Tale for analyzing the state of contemporary feminism and offering a pro productive path for it to follow in the future. In her book, Feminism's New Age, Gender, Appropriation, and the Afterlife of Essentialism, Carlin Crowley recounts that because she had been annoyed that her local feminist bookstore had transformed itself into a bookstore specializing in New Age works, she became determined to investigate and critically report on the New Age movement, into which category she places goddess worship. Noting that, quote, for a brief window of time in the 1970s, some lesbians and radical feminists were involved in go goddess worship and, uh, and Dianic Wicca, 
in a seamless way that made the spiritual, political, and vice versa, unquote. She was troubled, along with many other academic feminists, by the ways in which political and spiritual second wave feminism parted ways, with academic feminists like herself being embarrassed by goddess worship, particularly in its perceived lack of scholarly rigor and increasing concentration on personal rather than publicly political issues. However, by the end of her book, she reports that she now believes that, quote, spirituality and politics have yet to be truly integrated in most feminist conversations. But if integration of the two could be accomplished, it could represent the future of a multiracial and global feminism, unquote. Feminist theology scholar Rosemary Radford Ruther comes to a similar conclusion, as do myth scholars Anne Baring and Jules Cash Cashford. Increased academic study and contemplation of the spiritual and cultural meanings of goddess images, combined with political awareness and social activism, could reinvigorate feminism and allow it to take on a more holistic import for the lives of women worldwide. Returning to the end of the winner's tale, we may allegorically read Paulina as representing political feminism by constantly prodding her society's chief patriarch, Leontes, to acknowledge and repent his maltreatment of the female. And Hermione as embodying goddess feminism, slandered and made immobile, seeming to be only an image carved in stone. The realm of art is Hermione's only home until societal developments, including male desire for her as a living, warm, mature, sexual woman, and her daughter's wish for her to speak, enable her to, quote, be stoned no more, and to manifest herself as a self-actualizing human being. Perdita then, may then be interpreted as the feminism of the future, looking respectfully for blessing to her mother, who stands for the foremothers of the first and second waves of feminism, who gave her life. Although Hermione was transfixed in art until her society's patriarchal power structure was ready for her to return to life, so too art in the form of the music that Paulina summons contributes to her revival. Art has an, uh, an integral role in female liberation and self-actualization, particularly in this star study, The Art of Shakespeare, which exists in both passive form in the text and active form in the performances of his works by which his characters step into life. This book explores Shakespeare's treatment of female sexuality, Venus-associated erotics, as mediated by the politics determined in particular works poetics, genres as well as poetical, poetic imagery and symbols, in coming to terms with female characters' means of dealing with circumventing the label of sexually disparaging terms, particularly the name whore as they strive to rewrite, erase, or at least prove themselves to be more than that name." Unquote. Chapter two studies each of the forms of the word whore in Shakespeare's canon. Chapter three examines female characters who actually toil in the sex trade. Chapter four focuses on Cleopatra, the mortal character who most fully identifies herself with the goddess and who dies triumphantly as she mystically channels her. Channel five deal, chapter five deals with the quest for fulfillment of erotic de desire by female characters, primarily from Shakespeare's comedies, leading up to As You Like It's Rosalind, the character who explores most fully the potentials of human sexuality and moves toward the mystical condition of androgyny. Chapter six concentrates on Shakespeare's presentation of the goddess herself, Venus. And chapter seven offers a personal account of how Shakespeare's whores have influenced me in stripping down to my Venus-inspired love for the bard. That is, I give an account of the time that I did an academic Shakespearean striptease at a professional conference. There's a couple of pictures from that. Not to naked, but to a leotard, anyway. Okay, that is it, thank you. Would you entertain some questions from the audience? Any questions of? Um, Repeat. Dr. Stanton, three things. During Shakespeare's life, he was contemporary 
with her most gracious uh, queen, Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, queen Elizabeth, during her youth, was called the daughter of a whore, mm -hmm. and she had to she had to survive that. And she later became, like I said, the, the probably greatest monarch of her age, and certainly England's perhaps greatest monarch. Right. Okay, so he had to do it. She was also a patron of the arts. Yes. Second thing, uh, the actors that they were uh, played by women in those plays were cross-dressing men. Do you uh -huh. think that possibly has something to do with the way they acted? And the third thing, Shakespeare's greatest poems is the sonnets. Uh -huh. I mean, and they're wonderful. They appear to be written to a lover of his who was a male and a member of the aristocracy. So did he possibly have issue? <laughs> um, probably there were some issues <laughs> one way or another. Now, um, you've uh, laid out a number of uh, dimensions there. Uh, yes, Queen Elizabeth, hugely important figure. Um, she did, um, uh, we have um, her mentioning um, Shakespeare um, when um, there was an attempted coup against her by uh, Essex's men. And they hired Shakespeare, some of Shakespeare's actors to put on a performance of Richard II, which deals with the deposing of a king. Um, and she said, know ye not that I am Richard II? So she was quite aware of that. Those actors got put into jail, but Shakespeare was not among them. So either he, they did this without his consent, or she, got, she made it sure so he didn't get into trouble. I, we don't know. Uh, well, now, in terms of p personal lives of, the, of these figures, um, Queen Elizabeth um, apparently um, was, uh, was probably told by her doctors that it was unlikely that she was going to be able to carry a child to term. And so I think that that was probably a reason why she decided not to marry and to, k to cultivate this idea of the, of the virgin queen. Whether she actually maintained virginity for, uh, throughout her life, it's impossible to determine. Some people think that she was raped when she was a teenager. That may, may have been the case. Um, in terms of Shakespeare's sexuality, we don't have anything about, uh, about, uh, of evidence about his personal life beyond the fact that he did get married when he was 18 to a woman who was 26 and three months pregnant. Then he had three children with this woman. Um, and then he does write the sonnets. The first, eight, uh, the first 17 of them are to a young man. But those, in those sonnets, he is entreating the young man to get married and have children, to engage himself in a heterosexual relationship. We think it's likely that the parents of some wealthy aristocratic young man who is not interested in getting married may have hired Shakespeare originally to write sonnets, because uh, their son liked poetry, um, try to convince him to do his duty for the family and produce ch children. But there's the first 17 sonnets that he talks about that, and then he drops that subject and moves on. He does talk about an intense friendship later on in the series with a man, but it's, we, are, we can't tell for sure if it's the same man that was at the beginning or not. Uh, he also talks about a rival poet. But the most explicit that he is about sex in the sonnets is, with, is about the so-called dark lady. So the sonnets about the dark lady are, are ab absolutely very, very sexual. No mistaking that sex is going on between himself and this woman. Whereas the sonnets to the man, there's one that is somewhat ambiguous, where he says that um, uh, you are so, so beautiful that I could go for you, except that nature gave you one thing to my purpose, nothing. And because of that, she pricked you out for women's pleasure. So he seems to be saying, since you have a penis, nothing's going to happen between us. If you had been a woman, like your face looks like you would be, I'd be right on that. But since you've got a penis, no. OK, so that's what we get from, about sex from Shakespeare in the sonnets. But in the sonnets, maybe they're autobiographical, maybe they're not. We just don't know. It's possible that there are some autobiographical elements in there. But you can't trust poets in, in, in terms of the way that they're going to use their own biography. 
they will mess with it and make their, um, uh, uh, and even speaking in first person uh, will still treat their uh, life as raw material for art and they'll make it turn out the way that they have the, the, their artistic uh, sensibility tells them for that given purpose. So we just can't tell. Um, so it's possible that he was bisexual. We know that he had heterosexual experience because he fathered three children. Uh, we don't know for sure whether he had homosexual experience. It's possible that he did, but there's nothing that proves it one way or the other. Yes? Well, the definition of a whore is one who gets paid for sex. Were all of these characters in his play paid? No. But that's, uh, that, that's, the, that's the point. Um, in the, uh, the chapter in which I look at all the uses of the word whore in Shakespeare, I say um, I provide a definition. Uh, which is, uh, I don't have it with me, but it's um, uh, that, the, that when, a, when a woman is called a whore, it um, means woman who has sex for money or woman who has sex with a number of male partners or woman who has laid claim to by one male but um, who has interest in or conversations with other men and because of that is slandered into being a whore, or woman who even is a virgin, has nothing to do with a professional sex trade, has never accepted money, has does nothing but her husband or boyfriend or whatever, for some reason just projects this, um, this thing onto you, onto a person. As I said in the be beginning, I was, I've been called a whore lots of times. I have never accept, accepted money for sex. I'm not a sex worker. And I would guess that there are other women in the audience here who have been called a whore at some point in your life. If you'd like to raise your hand, go ahead. <laughs> um, but the, pardon me? I'm sorry. A professional study. A professional study? Uh, was it one of your colleagues? One of my colleagues? No. No, it was mostly men I dated. But it started, <laughs> but it started when I was in high school, as I tell in the, in the chapter where I look at, at all these instances. So um, there was some, some boy I'd gone out with once. I think there were a couple of kisses or something. Then the next Monday at school, another kid, his friend, He's leering at me, and then and, and we're sitting in homeroom or something, and he's across the room, and he's leering at me, and then he gets out a $20 bill, and he points to it, and he goes, you're a, you're a whore, right? Jerry told me you, that you, you'd, you'd do it for 20. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm like seven, 16, 17. I, I, I couldn't process this. It was just so bizarre to me. And I also tell about, um, and the reason I'm wearing red, um, in one of my, grads, my grad seminars on Renaissance drama, there was a, a woman in this class, a graduate student, uh, she'd had several courses from me. She started taking classes from me when she was an undergrad. She had transferred from Cal State Col uh, University from a small Bible college. She was a, a very wonderful, devout person, married with children. And she um, was wearing a red dress for the day of her presentation. And she said, uh, she asked the, the class, and there were about, in this class, there were about oh, seven women and five men, I think. And she said, how many of you have ever been called a whore? Of course, I put my hand up, you know. And, and about three or four of the other women did. And so, the other ones are just like, what? And then she said, yes, me too. And the first time was when I was five years old and wearing a red dress. And her male cousin, who was like eight or nine, said, you're wearing a red dress. You're a whore. And so, so I, I think women should be able to wear red. So I'm wearing red. <laughs> red a red dress doesn't make you a whore. Doesn't mean that, that, but that's the point. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you take, take um, money for sex or that you're a professional sex worker. It's a word that can be used to demean women and to take away any kind of credibility that they could, that they could assert. And you know that um, in the Renaissance, the model was for women to be chaste, silent, and obedient. 
So the first word, chastity. So chastity meaning virginity before marriage and then after marriage, thinking only of one's husband but never initiating sex herself, only waiting for whenever he wanted, all that stuff. But so, so chaste, so that is sexually uh, entirely controlled, um, and silent, don't, don't speak up against your husband or father, don't speak in public, and obedient, obedient to male will and the patriarchy. And one way that this was enforced was to tell women that if they spoke in public, that it impaired their modesty. And that's what Hermia says in Midsummer Night's Dream. When, she, when she's told that she has to marry your father's choice or be put to death, and then she asks the duke, you know, <laughs> can you please tell me this? And she says, I know not by what, by, by what I made so bold, or how it may impair my modesty, but I must ask, what is really the thing that can happen to me? How it can impair my modesty. And that's because women were told that if you are free with these lips, then the implication is that you would be free with those lips. And they actually said that, which is like so bizarre. But you know that there are still women who are intimidated from speaking in public. It's not ladylike. It's not ladylike for you to complain or for you to protest or for you to this, whatever. Yeah? Well, I think that's the issue with the Me Too movement. They're saying, why, why were all these women silent so many years ago? Uh, because they were fearful of being yeah. labeled uh, something they were not. And, and also, that's all they had. That's all that they couldn't. They couldn't. They couldn't be in the professions. Right. They they couldn't be a doctor or a lawyer or anything. So all they had would be their sexual integrity, yeah. and if that were taken away from them, they had no cho no opportunity for a respectable life at all. Yeah. And they knew that. They were very very conscious about that. So so this isn't something that occurred in the Renaissance. It's occurring now, and so it's. Apparently occurring in, uh, in children as well, where, you know, there, where there's an inequality of power, um, then you know your lips are sealed. You don't talk about it. So, um, so that's kind of an enduring kind of thing. Which is sure. I mean, the the Me Too movement right now, yeah. times up. I mean, just just this weekend, Les Moonves was fired from CBS from sexually exploiting women and um, impairing their careers. It's, it's current, it's right now. Yeah, and even if there were women that did voice what had happened, while well, I was just watching um, uh, Sunday morning on the whole gymnastics oh, um, yeah. scandal and what happened to those you know, 13, 14, 15 year old girls and how this has been going on for 20 years, uh, and how uh, the one girl that is now speaking, uh, she, I'm sure she's getting hate mail and death threats and everything else. So, uh, and being called more, most likely. Oh, yeah. So, in your classes, do you ever have any with, uh, Muslim women that you have to tell, you know, to not be so subservient? <laughs> well, it's not not my place to tell them that, but um, I I did make I was just teaching Midsummer Night's Dream just last week, and that where where Hermia says I know not by what power I'm made bold, right? And and, and about I just said, did the same thing about um, that I just did here. But the thing is that then she so she this this law is told to her where you have to marry your father's choice or be put to death. That's the way your father says it. Then when she talks to the Duke, the Duke says, well, there's actually a third option. You can become a nun. She goes, OK, I'll become a nun. But then we find out that her boyfriend cooks up a scheme where they're going to just run away. And they have to just have to go to the other side, to, to um, go through the forest, right? <laughs> outside of Athens, seven leagues outside of Athens, and they can get married. <laughs> like, the law cannot touch them. But that's the thing, is society makes people think that this is just the way things are. And I said, you know, like in, in Saudi Arabia, just within the year, women were given the right to drive. But you know, it's, hard, gonna, it's harder to, um, to, to do that kind of thing now with the internet. Because if you're in a country and there's no, no uh, access to the outside world, 
like say North Korea or something. You can tell people of North Korea anything because they don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. But if people have the access to the internet, then a woman can see, hey, wait a minute, in all these other countries, women can drive. So there's nothing constitutionally about being, having a female body that makes it impossible for a woman to drive. It's just my society decided to repress women in this way. Other societies don't, and if I went to another society, I'd be able to drive or whatever, right? So once people are educated that whatever their, their law and order place is telling them is the way things are, and they realize that you get a little bit of a broader perspective, it's not necessarily like that. It's not universal. There are places where you, can, you don't have to be repressed in that kind of way, that that's a, a kind of liberation for people then. Yeah. yeah. Where can we buy your book? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, um, right, right around here, um, it's at the Little Professor Bookstore. It is available now in paperback, too, so it's less expensive. Uh, but you can also get it on Amazon and any other kind of uh, book ordering kind of place. And the follow-up question, would you object if you would bring your hardcover book? Oh, I would, that would be great. Sure, of course, if you'd like to do that, I would be happy to sign it. Sure. Thanks. Great. During office hours. Pardon me? Only during your office hours. Oh, okay. <laughs> we wouldn't stop you on the street. <laughs> Actually, my, my nephew, uh, I just was in uh, San Diego over the weekend, and my nephew said, then he said to his, his um, he's an AP college prep uh, English classes in high school. And he said, oh, you know, they were doing some, some Shakespeare in class. And he said, oh, my aunt is a Shakespeare specialist. And the, the teacher said, oh, what's your aunt's name? And he said, Dr. K. And then the teacher went to his bookshelf and said, Stanton? And pulled out my book. I'm like, wow. <laughs> that was amazing. I couldn't believe it. Okay. All right. Any other any other questions? Not about signing my book. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay.